All right, so I wanted to do a really quick overview of some of the slides that we're going to cover in lecture on Wednesday. Uh, I guess consider this a primer on RISA 2D. Uh, we're probably going to be hopping back and forth a good bit between the slides and actually doing an interactive example. So I figured it would probably be worthwhile to take a second and just go through the presentation. Uh, there's a lot of uh, information and details here that we might hop back and forth on. And so consider this video a really good review of the key concepts when you're working on uh, homeworks or, or uh, uh, some of the problems uh, later on in the class. Let me turn on the laser pointer here. Okay, so uh, a little bit about RISA. Um, I, I tend to use RISA uh, in structural analysis uh, because it's very easy uh, to learn and it's very powerful. There's plenty of other software packages that are out there, but I found that uh, in order to get the point across and, and, and to get you to understand uh, the basics of how structural analysis software packages work, RISA 2D is, is the way to go. Uh, it has a, a couple of uh, things that I'd like to change, but by and large, I, I found it to be very powerful, uh, and um, uh, you can use it not just in classes, but but later on in your career. We'll be you can use this in here, and also in concrete design, steel design, you name it. Um, we're going to split our coverage of RISA into two lectures. The first lecture we're going to cover basically all of the force response in a structure, so support reactions. Uh, if we're doing trusses, uh, axial loads in the trusses, shear and moment diagrams, uh, etc. Uh, because the first lecture is not uh, going to be covering materials and section sets and deflections, really what we do in the first lecture is going to be limited to statically determinate structures. But once we know how to uh, handle materials and section sets, we can use RISA to do anything. Determinate, indeterminate, it doesn't matter. Um, the way RISA works is when you first open the program, uh, there's a little dialog box that pops up that you know says welcome. Uh, once you close that and you get into the operation, you're going to see this data entry toolbar uh, that pops up on the uh, uh, top right of the screen. The idea is each one of these buttons corresponds to a, a, a component of data that you need to define a model. And once you go through all of these, if you've properly defined each of these, you've defined your structure and you're ready to go. Um, a couple things about this. So we're in, in this course, there's a couple that we're not going to use. We're not going to use member design rules because we're, we're not in a design class. Uh, same thing with wall design rules. We're not going to be defining footings. We're just going to use the typical boundary conditions that we, we normally use in structural analysis. We're also not going to be defining like plates or wall panels, and also we're not going to be dealing with moving loads right now. We'll talk about that uh, maybe later on uh, when we get into influence lines. And so all we're going to use are the joint coordinates, the boundary conditions, the members, uh, the basic load cases, as well as the, the load definitions themselves, and the, the load combos. Uh, the first lecture on Wednesday, we're going to uh, uh, skip the materials and the section sets. We're going to do that uh, uh, after. They're really easy, but the, the, the point of it is, is that we'll uh, spend the first lecture just learning how to build uh, some basic models, and then we'll go back and refine them and get them just right by defining the materials and the section sets later. Long story short is that if you're uh, analyzing a statically determinate structure, you really don't need to worry too much about materials and section sets to get the force response right. The deflections won't match until your materials and section sets match, uh, but that'll become clear. Uh, after uh, after our second lecture on the topic. Okay, so when you open RISA, this is what it looks like. Um, and there's a lot of buttons, and it might seem overwhelming. We're not going to use every button, uh, but there's a couple of them that are worth mentioning, a couple of the toolbars. Uh, so, for instance, uh, this set of buttons right here, uh, and really all of this, is all about the zoom and the display, and so this is how you would you know, if you had your display and you wanted to rotate it about the x-axis or the y-axis, if you wanted to create an isometric view of your structure. This this is really doesn't matter very much for 2D analyses, which is, you know, what we've been doing in here. If you were doing a 3D analysis, you might want to rotate the structure in 3D so that you could kind of see it. But those uh, uh, features are still available in, um, uh, uh, in RISA 2D. Uh, this stuff over here 
that you can see this this is also on display but instead of views and rotations this is about the features so for instance if you want to turn the member labels on and off you would do this here uh, if you wanted to determine the display of the boundary conditions uh, and whatnot this is all about results so this is if you want to display like the shear diagram or the moment diagram uh, and there's a couple of other ways uh, to do that uh, one of the nice things about Risa is that uh, if there's something that you want to do, for instance, you want it to display the reactions, there's a couple of different ways to do that, and some are uh, easier th than others. Some of them have more features than others, but we'll, we'll get into that as we, uh, as we progress. Um, this uh, set of buttons right here is uh, if you want to graphically start drawing a structure and defining it. Uh, and that's fine if you want to get stuff uh, started, but usually you'll end up having to go into the data entry toolbar anyways to precisely define your joint coordinates and member sizes. And so I found from a, a classroom perspective as well as a real world perspective, I found it a lot easier to just use the spreadsheets. It ends up uh, uh, working out uh, uh, pretty well in the long run and you can define a model uh, pretty quickly. Uh, one thing, RISA can handle both US units and SI systems. If you click this, either the units button or you know, this button right here, um, it brings up this dialog box and you can change anything. You can change the lengths, the dimensions, you know, linear forces, you name it. You could use standard imperial, standard metric, or you could just change it to, to whatever you want. And whatever you do, whatever you change here, it'll automatically convert everything that's already built uh, uh, in your model. So it's pretty nice. Uh, so let's say you're building something, but oh, I want the linear forces in kips per inch or something. You can change it. It'll automatically update everything. So it's pretty nice. Okay. Uh, building a basic analysis model, and when I say basic analysis model, I mean one that's statically determinate. We really need to define two things, the geometry of the structure and the loads on the structure. On our second lecture, we're going to add to this and, and say, well, we need to define the geometry of the structure, the loads on the structure, but we also need to make sure that the stiffness of the structure is defined appropriately. But for today, we're going to focus on the geometry uh, and the loading. That's what we're going to discuss in our first lecture. So what do I mean by the geometry? I mean ensuring that you've got the joint coordinates all where they need to be, uh, that you've got the boundary conditions defined, and then you've got the members defined. As for the loads on the structure, uh, we need to actually load it. There's three different load options that are available in RISA, joint loads, point loads, and distributed loads. We also need to create a load combination. Um, it's kind of for, for um, for what we do in structural analysis in the class, it's kind of nitpicky, but that'll become much more um, uh, of a necessity in design courses like steel design, concrete design, because you'll have different load cases for, uh, for different types of events, but, but I'll get to that here in a bit. Um, and in order to define one of these, again, you go into each of these uh, uh, data entry uh, tools, and as you click one, it opens a spreadsheet. You start filling the spreadsheet in, and, and there you go. Um, when we define the geometry in RISA, so now we're getting into some, some concept issues. So let's start off with the geometry. When you're defining the geom geometry, the, the biggest thing to understand is just coordinate systems, Cartesian coordinates. So let's say I had a beam here. This beam is 40 foot long. And let's say this is the only model I wanted to define, just this. Um, I can define this model however I want in terms of a coordinate system as long as I have a consistent origin. Uh, RISA doesn't tell you where to place the origin. You need to figure that out as the analyst. Um, but you've got a couple of different options. Like if, if I was modeling this, I'd probably set point A to be 0, 0, and so point B would be 40, 0. But nothing tells the analyst that's how it has to be. I could put A at 20, 10, and put B at 60, 10, and put A at... I don't know, negative 50 comma 25 and point B at negative 10 comma 25. It can be anything as long as the distance from point A to point B is 40 foot long in the X direction. And so you can put that beam wherever you want. You just need a consistent origin. So having a consistent origin is probably one of the most important aspects to ensuring you're defining your model correctly. Um, as for, and, and in terms of defining the geometry, it's pretty much that, that, uh, that straightforward. Uh, loading, there's a couple things you need to be aware of on loading. There are three different types of loads that you can prescribe in RISA. Uh, you have joint loads, point loads, and, and uh, distributed loads. Now, what are the difference between joint loads and point loads? They kind of operate the same. The only difference is where you can apply them. So joint loads can only be applied at the joints. Point loads can be applied on the member. 
Uh, so, for instance, if we're modeling a truss, we would use only joint loads. But if we're modeling a beam, we might use a combination of joint loads and point loads. Uh, same thing with uh, distributed loads. Distributed loads, they're, they're on the member. Um, now, I have these loads drawn in, uh, as vertical loads. For instance, when, uh, a, when I'm defining a joint load, a joint load could be a number of things. It could be a load in the x direction. It could be a load in the y direction. It could be a moment. You can apply a concentrated moment as a joint load. You can apply a concentrated moment as a point load. Okay, so all of that is in the same menu. Really the, the, the difference is whether or not the loads are at the joints or whether or not they're at, they're at the members. As you begin to define those loads, you can specify, I want this load in the x direction, I want it in the y direction, I want a concentrated moment, uh, etc. Distributed loads are all defined uh, with the same option. You can define uniformly distributed loads that you see here. You can define triangular loads. You can define trapezoidal loads. And, and as you get into playing around with the load definition, it's, uh, it's pretty easy. All right. When you're defining loads in RESA, if they're joint loads, you just specify it's on joint 6 or joint G or however you're numbering or la uh, labeling your joints. You just say it's on that joint and the direction and the magnitude. Uh, for member loads, you need to specify where they occur on the member. So for instance, if I was defining these loads, I have a 20 kip load, a 15 kip load, and a 16 kip load, and they're along the member. So if I've defined the member from A to B, then the locations need to be measured from A. And so that first load would be 10 feet from A, the second load would be 20 feet from A, the, the third load would be 32 feet from A. You can specify that in uh, just you know, raw dimensions, or you can specify them as a percentage of the length of the member. So this first load is 25% along the member because the member is 40 foot long and that's 10 foot out. And that might be uh, uh, valid if you want to start changing member lengths and whatnot. For instance, if you know you're going to have a load at mid-span, but the member length keeps changing, then defining it this way using this percent 50 uh, would ensure that the load is always at mid-span. Uh, another thing to keep in mind is your coordinate system. These loads are all pointing down, so when you specify these loads in uh, RESA, they're all specified as negative. So this would be a negative 20 kip load, negative 15 kip, negative 16 kips. Uh, just something to keep in mind as you begin uh, modeling. Uh, local versus global coordinate systems. Honestly, not going to matter a whole lot when you're first uh, playing around with, with RESA. However, if you're starting to get into some more funky modeling, you kind of need to watch out for stuff like this. So, for example, um, in RESA, uh, when you start defining loads, you'll see uh, little x's and y's and big x's and y's. So, for instance, if I'm defining uh, a distributed load, you'll, you'll see a number of different, different options. It's like, well, what's the difference between the big x's and the little x's? Well, this is a, a topic in, in uh, indeterminate analysis and computer analysis of structures uh, uh, called the, the, the difference between a local coordinate system and a global coordinate system. Global coordinate systems are the single coordinate system that defines the entire structure. So, for instance, if this is, um, uh, if we're talking about this structure, maybe the y-axis goes this way, the x-axis goes this way, and maybe point A is the origin. And so that's the origin for the entire structure. That's the global coordinate system. The local coordinate system is the coordinate system for each member. So, for instance, if I'm talking about member AG, AG, you know, maybe that's the x-axis going from A to G, and the y-axis goes like that. The, the reason why that's uh, uh, an important, you know, distinction is if you are looking at a truss like this, this 10 kilonewtons, you know, I might align that along the global y-axis, but the 6 kilonewtons might be along the local y-axis of, of a given member. So if you're wanting to apply loads perpendicularly to a member and the member's oriented, that, that's what's going on. If your member's just, you know, uh, like a beam and it's just going in one direction, then this won't really matter. But it's just something to think about uh, as you're, you're building a model. Okay. Basic load cases and load combinations. Okay, so the easiest way to describe that without getting into like structural steel design or reinforced concrete design or something like that uh, is to uh, think about this in terms of programs like AutoCAD or MicroStation that you might be uh, familiar with. If you're an AutoCAD user, you're probably used to the term layers in AutoCAD and MicroStation are called levels. So let's go back to, to CAD. So let's say you're drafting uh, plans for a I don't know, a, 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 a 
dog park in an area and so you've got the the drawings and so you've got the sidewalks and the trees and the grass and all this and the the dimensions and so sometimes when you're drafting that in in a CAD uh, uh, software let's say AutoCAD you'd put each of those objects on a different layer so I might have the sidewalks on on its own layer and the shrubs on its own layer and the dimensions and the title block and all that stuff and then uh, with that I can turn those layers on and off or activate those layers one at a time and so it helps me organize the the uh, the drawing as I build it. Uh, Risa sort of allows you the same functionality with basic load cases so the idea is let's say I have a beam and I've got a bunch of different loads on it. I've got dead loads on it. I've got snow loads on it. I've got live loads on it and so maybe what I'll do is I'll uh, organize each of those loads into a layer if you will and, and Risa calls those layers basic load cases and so I'm if I'm an analyst uh, uh, analyzing a given structure I might have a, a layer if you will for dead loads or a layer for live loads or so on and so forth um, for us in structural analysis we'll just use one uh, basic load case we'll just put everything all in one because we're not dealing with load factors or design specs uh, uh, just yet now the reason why RISA allows you this uh, functionality is because of load combinations. So when you take steel design or concrete design, what you'll find is that we don't ever just treat loads as they are without applying some sort of safety factors to them. And for the loads, that means increasing the loads by a certain amount. It's kind of like a safety factor for the loads, you, you up the loads. But we don't just lump them all uh, together and just multiply them by two or something. We have calibrated load uh, factors for different events. So for instance, the dead loads sometimes have different load factors than the live loads. And so maybe one load combination would be we take the dead loads, multiply them by 1.2, and we take the live loads, multiply them by 1.6. This is a very common load combination. If you all take me for, say, steel design next semester, we're going to be using this a lot in there. Um, and so uh, what RISA will do is it'll work through all those load combinations for you. For us, we're not going to have to worry about that, but we will have to specify a load combination in RISA. We'll just use uh, a single basic load case and a, a load factor of one. Uh, so you'll see, um, you'll see as we do that uh, in our in our in class example during the next lecture, you'll see how that's uh, uh, how that's handled. Okay. Analyzing the model once it's created. So you've built the geometry, built the loads, uh, and built the stiffness, which is what we'll talk about during the second uh, part of this uh, lecture series. But once you've done all that, you've built everything, you've defined everything, now you have to tell Risa to actually analyze it. So in structures land, we call this the, the sort of the step where you go from pre-processing to post-processing. So pre-processing is creating the model, creating the loads, the materials, the boundary conditions, all of that, and then uh, uh, the post-processing is dealing with the results. So from pre-processing uh, pre to post-processing, you have to actually solve the structure. Uh, and so there's two ways to do that. You just hit the solve button or this equal sign and a little dialog box will pop up. You check it and there you go. Um, now, uh, during this first lecture and as you're playing around with the, the software and learning it, uh, you might get a warning that maybe looks something like this, like a P-Delta alert or direct analysis or something like that. Uh, for right now, disregard it. We'll be able to attack and, and understand what that means uh, maybe after lecture two. Th this really relates to the materials and the section sets, and I'm holding off on that. I want to wait to handle that later. And we'll discuss that more in concrete and, uh, and steel design. Um, so once you're in post-processing phase, so you've clicked the button, you've solved it, and you've run the model, it might seem a bit anticlimactic because once you click the button and you run it, nothing really pops up and you probably expect like all these answers to flow at you. Well, the answers are there. You have to go into RISA and view those results. You have to tell RISA, I want to see this or I want to know what these values are. Once you run the, um, uh, run the model, a second toolbar will pop up. Uh, and uh, so the point I'm making is that there's really two ways to view the results. The first is the spreadsheet toolbar that pops up, and that's really good for joint level data. So if you want the reactions or displacements at particular joints, it works very well. Uh, you can also view member level data, but if there's a lot of members, the spreadsheet gets real big real quick. 
Uh, and so the model display options menu is good for viewing overall results. So maybe the spreadsheet toolbar is looking at members one at a time and then the model display uh, options is good for the overall menu. I think it's a really good idea, like if you've built a model, to play around with the model display options. Go in there and look at all the things that it can show you. There's a lot of really good um, uh, really good information that can be gathered from your analysis. And, and there, you'll find that the, the uh, investment in building a model is very low. It doesn't take a long time to build a structural analysis model in RESA, but you can get a lot of really good data out of an analysis. It's really worth playing around with it a bit. Um, one thing you do want to be aware of but when you start looking at the results, and if, if there's one thing I could change in RESA, it would be the sign conventions. So first off, let's talk about the external loads and responses. So this is like your reactions, your deflections. This follows typical Cartesian coordinates. So the loads and deflections that are upward are positive, loads and deflections that are rightward are positive. So when you open up the table and look at the data, if you have a deflection that's in the x direction and it's negative 0.46 inches, that's 0.46 inches to the left. Um, with moments and rotations, counterclockwise uh, is positive. Now what I don't, uh, 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 or I guess what I'm not the biggest fan of is the, the sign conventions. RESA considers compression positive, which that's, that's okay and, and, and it makes sense because if you're designing a building, a building is a collection of columns and beams. I just want to know the compression in the columns and the bending in the beams. So the uh, compression will take the, uh, uh, we, when you're designing the program, just take the compression positive. I just need to know the, uh, the forces in the columns. So that's why uh, RESA 2D considers compression positive. As for the moment diagrams, when you run RESA, your moment diagrams are actually going to be upside down. Uh, the reason for that is it comes from a, a, a classical technique for drawing moment diagrams where the, uh, the idea is that if you draw the moment diagram upside down, it if you're doing reinforced concrete design, it tells you what side of the beam to put the rebar on and then how much of it. So if you have a really big moment diagram, you've got a lot of moment, put a lot of rebar there. Um, I, and, I, and I understand the visual aspect of that. I've always just felt it's a bit counterintuitive when you're actually drawing the moment diagram. So when you run RESA, your moment diagrams are going to be upside down. That's okay. Like it's the same values is just going to be flipped. Um, just something to keep in mind. Okay. Here's some tips and tricks for RESA. Um, as you build a, a model, there's you're, you're going to run into to issues. You're going to run into errors, and uh, there's also some tips I can give you for building things a, a bit faster. Okay. First off. Let's talk about some keyboard shortcuts. You're going to be working in these database spreadsheet uh, uh, toolbars a lot. So a couple things. Uh, one of the, I guarantee you every single person uh, in this class is going to be typing uh, data out to define their structure and they're going to have an extra row in their table. The F4 key will delete a row uh, in a table. Okay. Uh, boundary conditions. When you're defining boundary conditions, there's a couple of ways to do it. You can click the little arrow and it brings up a, a big dialog box. But in a given cell, if you type the letter R, uh, R will restrain a joint in one direction. It's a really quick way of defining the boundary conditions. I'll use that during our, our first demonstration lecture, uh, and this is where that's coming from. When you're defining your members, there's a primary tab and an advanced tab. And in the advanced tab is where you select the releases uh, on each member. If you type the letter P, that'll release the moment at the end of a one member. And so there's two applications for that. One is if you want to define an internal hinge uh, in a beam. Uh, and the second is when you define a truss. You're going to pin all the ends of all the members, and that's how you uh, model a truss. Uh, one of the other things that you might end up doing just by accident is there, that data entry toolbar. You might accidentally close it. If you click the spreadsheet menu and check spreadsheet buttons toolbar, that'll bring it back up. So just that, that's an easy thing to, uh, uh, to miss. When you start defining the loads, uh, I, 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 this is a common question, is you start defining the loads, but they don't show up. They, they're not displayed. Well, unlike the geometry, the geometry is always displayed unless you, you know, manually turn that off. Uh, you have to actually tell RESA to turn the loads on and off. And the reason why is because of those basic load cases. You could have a bunch of different layers, and so RESA will display those one at a time. There's a button here on the top, this uh, button with the two uh, arrows pointing to the dot. That's the button to turn the display on and off. I know in, in AutoCAD it's like a light bulb for each layer. That, think of that as kind of the light bulb button. That'll turn on and off the, the display of the loads.
What if it won't run or you're diagnosing errors? Um, uh, first off, the boundary conditions. Did you define all of them? You know, pen, uh, boundary conditions need two reactions, fixed need three. Did you forget to define one? That's an easy thing to cause your model to not run or to have an issue. What about the basic load cases and load combinations? Are all the loads in one basic load case? Did you forget to define the load combination? Very easy thing to forget. And then the advanced members tab, are all the end connections correct? Um, those are issues that will, will primarily cause your model, like if, if you get all these right, your model should run. As to whether or not the answers are correct, um, there's really two things you can do. Go through, check your data, ensure that the uh, uh, individual values match what they should, uh, and then also look at your materials and your section sets, and that's what we'll talk about during the second lecture, to see whether or not um, uh, you've defined everything and whether or not it's uh, attaching uh, properly. So I'm going to actually call it there. What I'm going to do during lecture, uh, during our first demo, is I'm going to basically jump right in to analyzing this beam. Okay? Uh, and what we'll do is I'll go through step by step, and I'll, like I said, I'll probably be hopping back and forth between the slideshow uh, and the um, uh, and uh, uh, um, RISA itself. And the idea is we'll build this one together, and then I'm going to have you all do this one and this one. And so between those uh, problems, you'll see how it's uh, it's it's uh, pretty straightforward. Uh, and that's all. That's all I have.